morning, Good all morning. of you people who were, to have not found the late night drinks and are actually getting something out of your, your fee. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, one of the first panels of the proper session, uh, past the introductions. Um, my name is Dawn Porter. I'm an uh, independent producer, but I worked for A&E Television for five years in the US, and before that I worked for ABC News. Um, so I've been working on history and uh, science programming for a while now. Um, this is one of my favorite things about Sheffield is uh, in addition to, we get a lot of market information, um, but I think uh, it's really great to focus on craft and on trends. Uh, and so you have a really great panel that has, um, despite their youthful appearance, uh, has uh, seen the evolution of programming in the genres that we all care about and love over the past uh, few decades. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, you get to watch TV, so we know you all like that. Um, and we're going to start, we're going to go through uh, different genres and have people present some of the really most um, uh, important iconic images uh, of history and science programming over the past decade. So we're going to start with Alison Lee, um, who may be known to many of you as uh, the executive producer of the World Congress Science and Factual Producers. Um, yay! Yay! Not just for Alison, but for also uh, such a, a great uh, conference that she runs. Um, Allison, uh, before bringing us all the best in, in science and history programming, um, was a commissioning editor for the ABC in Australia for 10 years. So uh, she is really uniquely qualified to talk about then and now, and she's going to show a clip of uh, a really special clip. And we thought we'd just kick off with, this was the opening clip that we showed for our session called What's the Buzz uh, last year at the Science and, history, uh, science and Factual Congress. Um, and it's just a montage, just a jazzy montage, but what it does show are the fantastic um, production values that we actually now have currently and, you know, what people have to live up to. So do you want to press that button? This is just about two minutes of fun. Okay. <coughs> so, I mean, I think one of the things that's really different is, for example, that our, co our, so our Congress ten years ago was the World Congress of Science Producers. And then it turned out that everyone that was involved in science television was crossing over into history and natural history. And so we, we broadened and we became, um, we embraced all those genres. And I think people are going backwards and forwards all the time now. Um, and, I, and I really don't think that if we'd done a compilation um, 10 years ago, we would have seen those kinds of, you know, fun things going on. I, I mean, in science, I just talk about science now. I mean, I do think science by and large was, you know, much more serious certainly much more straight. Um, I mean, in terms of style, anyway. Um, I, but in terms of subject matter, I mean, I think this is one of the most amazing things. I think, you know, actually, not that much has changed because we're still doing the same old subjects. We're just doing them in a different way and with higher production values. But I want to come back to that in a minute. Um, so 10 years ago, I talked to some of my colleagues at the BBC, you know, science, the, the horizon was, you know, the super strand. Um, science actually was mighty at the BBC, and it was winning RTS awards and BAFTA awards, or certainly Horizon was. And, um, but the big breakthrough was actually 12 years ago, and it was 1999, and it was this program called Walking with Dinosaurs. Has anyone not heard of Walking with Dinosaurs? It's quite possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, Walking with Dinosaurs was, was, was very risque at the time because it introduced the concept of using fictional characters to drive factual programs. And it was uh, caused quite a stink. And we actually had endless um, discussions at Science Congress for about the next five years while this genre ran its course because after that it sort of became the way of telling stories. So it was, you know, uh, Pyramid, Pompeii, um, who, um, no, Krakatoa. Colosseum. Hmm? Colosseum. I mean, they, 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 there were just so many. And, um, and we used to have these sessions saying, is it, is it all right? I mean, you know, is this entertainment instead of education and all this? Anyway, of course, it just happened. And, it, and are you, could we play the dinosaur thing? I'll just explain what this clip is. So I want to show you this clip from Walking with Dinosaurs because I think it's a lovely example of where you could say that maybe the line had been crossed because the dinosaurs are driving this narrative. And, um, well, anyway, have a look and then I can tell you what I mean after. That'll do. You get the idea. 
so there's this family of dinosaurs, and they're completely fictional, but everything they're doing, so, so the BBC um, would have us believe, and I'm sure it's true, is based on um, you know, everything that was known about the science at the time. And the other thing that would be uh, really interesting to talk about later in discussion is you know, the difference between, I mean, that was absolute state of the art. Um, 3GI at the time, CGI at the time, and of course, you know, now we've, we've moved on to 3D. So that's that, and oh, actually, did anybody see Atlantis um, went out on the BBC earlier this year? It, I think that's the first time that this great sort of drama doc, fictional driving fact sort of came back big time, but I don't think it's necessarily going to set a genre in the way that, that it did last time. But anyway, so the fact, fact, fact drama, that, that sort of went out, and in came um, and the presenter. And the presenter has come in and out and in and out over the years, but the presenter's really in big time now. Um, ten years ago, it was Robert Winston and uh, Robert Winston and Robert Winston and <laughs> Robert Winston, and he was actually presenting everything. Um, you know, the human body, inside the human body. Um, interestingly, the BBC has trained up other presenters, and um, you've probably seen them, Ian Stewart would be, Alex, Alex Roberts, Alice Roberts. Um, Michael Mosley is just on air right, right now with Inside the Human Body, I mean, it's even got the same title. Um, and then, of course, you know, the rock superstar, Brian Cox. So Brian Cox, um, Wonders of the Solar System. Um, Ten years ago, the BBC were doing a series called The Planets. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's the same, you'd think, oh, same old, same old material, should they be doing that? But actually, you know, in ten years, it's quite interesting how much more science you, you have actually got to tell. So apart from the style telling, the subject's the same, but the actual subject matter of the programme is very different. Ten years ago, um, the planets, um, we didn't know anything about the planet moons, for example. And um, a lot of the wonders of the solar system was able to bring new information to us about that, amongst many other things as well. Um, and um, what else about that? Yeah, well, dinosaurs. I mean, dinosaurs, um, Andrew Cohen at the BBC was telling me that they've found out, found more dinosaurs um, in the last two years than, you know, I think that's right, let me just get that right, go in my notes somewhere. More dinosaurs in the last year or two than, you know, like in the last sort of, you know, since we've been looking at dinosaurs. And they've come from China and the Arctic and elsewhere. And, and this has actually meant that there is, you know, you'd think, oh God, you know, not another series on dinosaurs. There's going to be a big um, planet dinosaur coming out from BBC later this year. But um, there's reason for it. There's, there's lots of new information that we didn't know before. So, Alison, let me ask you, um, so other than, uh, so the style, clearly, you know, I mean, one thing I think it's helpful to say, we say 10 years ago, so that's only 2001, which doesn't sound yeah. like it's that yeah. long ago, but clearly yeah. there have been huge changes. So one big change is all the different kinds of uh, options for people to view information. So well, I think I think that um, do you, do, I was wondering. Do you think that has changed? That has put pressure on what the style, you know? Because to me, like one of the biggest differences there then and now is a bit of the pacing. Um, well, pacing absolutely, and MTV style and all mm -hmm. that. And if you want to, do you want me to just show the, the contrast between the planets and? and yeah. I mean, I think even the planets were, were, were just. Um, do you want to try and just play a little bit of the planets, and then we'll talk about? I think he, this was you know, quite advanced for its time. It's not actually the old voice of God, which is kind of what we used to have. Just play a little bit of the plants. Ten years ago, that was really interesting because they'd obviously tried to get away from the voice of God narration, and they'd, you know, use the text instead, and they'd use the pop songs, but, you know, there's, there's no presenter. Um, can, we, can we put on Brian Cox? But just before you do, I mean, just to, it's what Dawn's saying. I mean, the thing about Brian Cox is, you know, the, the difference between then and now. The presenter used to, when there, when there was a presenter, like the Robert Winston, a piece to camera, fully scripted, um, got to do it all in one take, you know, and, um, and everything very rigid. And now the change is amazing. It's MTV TV in science. And Brian Cox is, as you'll see, sort of, you know, in all sorts of wonderful situations. It's jump cuts. It's, it's quite different. Let, let's have a look. It's, it's amazing. It won the Royal, Royal Television Society Award for Best Presenter and Best Factual Programme. I'm not, I'm not surprised. You know, the, the production values are absolutely incredible. 
I'm very quickly just going to go through what was happening over at Channel 4, which has really changed and is really not actually changing very much now, but did set the trend then. So formats is what it was all about. You know, 10 years ago at Science Congress, we were talking about formats. Ooh, really? Don't know about that. Oh dear, that's not very serious. Um, well, you know, the sort of things that came up at Channel 4 at, at 10 years ago, we already had... Um, um, the 1900s hats, which had been invented. But that, while it sounds like history, it's, that, it's what I was talking about at the very beginning. It's the crossover between the genre. We call it living history now, but that was all about technology and learning about how technology changes your lives. So that spawned, you know, 1940s house, Edwardian house, blah, blah house, pioneer house. Um, but I think, I want to quickly go to the, go, I'll come to the clip in a sec. It's very clever how how the, the best production companies are evolving those things and finding new ways to make them now. Um, yeah, maybe that is all I have to say about that. It's, um, so we're going, I'm going to show you a clip of the young ones because it's actually 1900 House, you know, in 2011. It's putting people, um, old people, in a house to recreate a science experiment. It's very kind of flimsy science, really, but it's real science. There was an experiment that said that if you put old people into back into their young situations and play them the records that they used to listen to when they were young, uh, then they would actually feel young and their health would be better. And so they recreated that experiment. And then it will go, after that, it will go into um, a second programme, which is actually an Australian programme, which you, I, I, I suspect many of you won't have seen. And it's the absolutely now thing of what people are trying to do with science. It is so formatted. And it was, it's called Making Australia Happy. And it takes eight miserable people and puts them through this kind of, you know, this psychology and, and exercise and stuff and, you know, makes them happier. Brings, and, you know, they score happier at the end of it. Let's have a look. So that, that's enough from me. I'm going to pass on. But just the last couple of things to say is if you noticed Michael Mosley in that first clip, that's, that's a kind of trend at the moment. That you have, a, you have the format, but you have the presenter telling you what's going on in the format. They didn't actually have that in Making Australia Happy. <coughs> what I'd say about that is, it's still possible to do really, you know, it's good science in Making Australia Happy. There's not much of it, but mm -hmm. what there is is very good. So that's, um, that, that's great, thank you. Um, just uh, two, one little takeaway before we leave you, Alison. So when, what do you think commissioners are looking for? Oh, now? Look, that, no, no, let, let me tell you that after. Let's okay. go on to everybody else, because I've got, I've got plenty about that, but I've talked for long enough. All yeah, right. Yeah. You promise mm -hmm. to come back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we're going to uh, move to Simon. We're going to move to uh, uh, more about um, natural history, uh, which is which is very exciting. Um, so Simon uh, has this long career, uh, three decades. He said that I could say out loud um, in television, uh, running Britain's largest distribution company. Um, uh, Large distribution business, uh, so selling programs all over the world. Some of the most, um, you know, some of the biggest programs uh, sold to the Southern Star Group, uh, where he became head of factual uh, and produced uh, and created many of the the big uh, natural history programs, including the very famous Meerkat Manor, who, which I think is uh, not an understatement to say really changed uh, how we all think of how natural history programming. Uh, could be produced, so I'll let you get right into it. Right, hello. Um, what I've decided to do today, um, to try and describe uh, how the genre has evolved over the last 10 years um, to today, and, and hopefully look in the crystal ball and decide where we're going from here, is to take two broadcasters, producer broadcasters, which basically sit at the same table, but very much at different ends. And um, I've um, got a whole lot of clips for us to look at from, uh, from the BBC Natural History Unit and also from Animal Planet in the UK. Um, and they do very different things. Um, unlike uh, Animal Planet and Discovery in the US, they don't have the benefits uh, of the joint venture with the BBC. So they have to program entirely domestically uh, and um, either through acquisition or production, but for a very local audience. And of course, you know, the BBC with a massive um, uh, potential for budgets um, through uh, through the license fee. Um, unlike unlike the BBC, Animal Planet um, are very, have very limited resources. They've got to do uh, put on screen very much more for less, lower budgets, limited resources. So it's produced um, probably. Uh, I mean, I think by looking at both the output, the output of both those um, 
from those channels, it gives you a sense uh, of exactly what the difference is between um, uh, the different areas of scale within the genre. Um, the, the BBC clearly um, are uh, the market leader um, because of the, the, the massive, massive resource that they bring to the genre in that um, they can play with the technology. They really are um, uh, the group that pushes out the envelope as far as the, the iconic images. Um, Animal Planet has to, has to be found among the clutter of many, many channels, and uh, they've, um, uh, they've really relied entirely on different narrative devices um, and formats to, um, to attract audiences. And uh, that has changed quite dramatically, actually, over the, over the last decade, as we'll see from the various clips. But uh, um, I think uh, you know, the other point to make is that natural history is a very overcrowded market. Um, the, there really are no more major broadcast organisations um, involved in the production and transmission of programmes. And uh, so very little has changed in terms of the, the number of hours, of hours being produced. And conversely, because uh, the last 10 years has been economically quite difficult for, uh, for broadcasters, um, budgets have remained static. And, you know, particularly for organisations like Animal Planet and Discovery, that really has put an enormous amount on on producers to find increasingly imaginative ways um, to uh, to tell stories for, for very little. Um, so I think it's not very little. Yeah, very little. <laughs> it's not very little. Well, so it is in, in terms of that you know you can still get a fifty thousand pound budget today for a program that you. But that's very little. Yeah, that is very little. And, uh, um, and, but so, and so you're really talking about not only your then and now yeah. but also scale, larger yeah. uh, versus somewhat smaller. I mean, I think to me it's it's interesting to hear you talk about you know behemoth like discovery yeah. as as you know really competing in this market. So and and that is a change that has happened yeah. in the last ten years. In the UK, you know, in the US, of course, with their joint venture, that they will co-produce Blue Planet, Planet mm -hmm. Earth, or whatever. But so those are rare. Those are those yeah. are not yeah. you know yeah. Planet Earth, big giant. Yeah. More along the lines of the BBC, and in fact, yes. you know, the BBC. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what, what we're going to see from uh, from the, the tapes, uh, tapes I've got today, I've, um, I've, I've got a variety of tapes, um, uh, starting off with um, uh, a 2000 BBC Natural History Unit uh, presentation reel, which features Blue Planet, Lion, Spy and the Dead, and is to Amazon and Big Cat Die, all absolutely iconic BBC series. And, um, you know, stand the test of time, but when compared to what the, t the BBC now brings in terms of the technology that it's, it's able to, to utilise, still look pretty clunky. I mean, CGI and, and high, high definition formats were very much in their uh, infancy. When we look at what Animal Planet had, um, uh, they, they, they were really defined by people like Steve Irwin and Crocodile Hunter. You had to do something different um, if you wanted to be in that game. You couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't stand up um, to, to the BBC in terms of straight narrative wildlife programming. You know, the last 30, 40 years, every animal on the planet has been has been filmed. Um, you know, there are new stories, and there are you know unique access will, will, will give you uh, give you the chance of producing uh, producing a, a program. But where the BBC wins every time is that you know they can come along and just produce stunning images with million pound budgets. So if you want to be, you know, if you want to produce for anybody else is really about um, story, narrative device, presenters. Um, and uh, by the time we get to the, to the last clip, so I've got um, uh, network presentation reels for 2011 from Animal Planet, uh, and also the BBC, you'll see that Animal Planet really isn't doing any natural history, actually. It's, it's all, it's all um, unscripted uh, formats. It's pets and bets. And, you know, and, uh, um, and the, you know the other interesting thing is, I mean, the BBC would be very forthcoming in terms of what they were up to. And in 2000, uh, they had 32 different projects, um, um, and a lot of that was presenter-led programming uh, and, and lower budget. But obviously, the iconic blue chip um, projects that we all identify with BBC, um, they have exactly half that number of projects in, in 2000 and 2011 on the slate of 16. Um, and I don't have exact details on the number of hours, but um, the slightly uh, grim-faced uh, friend of mine of the BBC Natural History Unit said that's much less than half the number of hours being produced by the BBC. And what about the budgets? Well, uh, I mean, you know, the, B 
the, the big the big high def budgets. I mean, BBC could put you know a million a million pounds plus plus into those programs. But but so are the, are the budgets comparable <coughs> from ten years ago, or have they decreased the number of hours but increased the budget to give you you know just overwhelm? No, the no I think uh, I think you know at, at the high end, the BBC have increased the budgets, and they do a lot in co-production to to raise a lot of money. I mean. Um, you know, if you look at the credits, not only Discovery, it's NHK and German broadcasters and whatever, but, um, but uh, you know, in terms of presenter-led programming, um, it's, uh, these days, it's really Springwatch, you know, there's um, uh, the really wild show and things like that, which were, you know, iconic sort of daytime shows and, you know, no longer really sitting in the schedule, so, you know, it's rather sad, there, there, there is less of it going on. Um, so, I think... Uh, you know, probably what we should do is go straight into the, the, the first uh, BBC clip. Um, the BBC's provided me very long sequences, so when we've seen enough of Blue Planet, we'll go on the lines, spy in the den, and then Andy's to an Amazon and Big Cat Diary, but we're going to have to fast forward because so otherwise you'll, we'll be here till lunchtime. So you'll, you'll queue? Uh, uh, well, yeah, yeah. Well, when we think we've had enough. Together? Anyway, anyway Blue Planet was, uh, was absolutely at its time and still remains one of my top, top five shows of all time. And, uh, um, but you know the other interesting thing about the BBC, I should say, is that, is that they, you know, if I have one criticism of what they do, it, their imagery is absolutely stunning, and each show produces a new way of showing natural history images. Um, and, but to be honest, there's very little story, uh, because they can just wow you with uh, with the audience. And I think, you know, I mean, I I would say that's that's a, a real danger with the BBC that they lose lose direction in that regard. Or an opportunity for five yeah. stars. Yeah, for an opportunity to run up. So, um, should we uh, roll into the planet, please? I think um, we'll, we'll one more thing. So, sorry, I missed out one. That was actually Predators, which was uh, the BBC's really first uh, first attempt at a very CGI-driven uh, driven natural history program. Um, the sort of thing you see on Discovery, actually. Um, Lion, Spy, and the Dead, if you could wind on onto that, was, um, uh, I mean, I think by today's uh, standards, it's probably seemed to be really clunky. I mean, it's, there's this boulder with a robot in it. Which wanders around and gets inside the lion's uh, the lion's pride, and it's, uh, at its time, it was um, you know it was you know, unique in it because it was actually enabling you to actually see what goes on you know, from an immediate distance rather than from far. Obviously, the CGI and, uh, and filming techniques has moved on considerably since then. The other uh, the other tapes I've got are far more controllable, which is the BBC were a bit more generous with the uh, the length of each of the clip. Um, um, and it's to Amazon. I mean, certainly slightly later than 2000, but it was really, um, again, I think number two on my, my uh, top five uh, BBC programs of all time. Just absolutely stunning photography. The last tip from the BBC is something completely different uh, Big Cat Diary, which um, endured for about th four seasons, I think. Um, um, it was really uh, the, the kind of presenter led show I think all, any, anybody, everybody would dream of. I mean, it was. Um, uh, at the face value, there was a lot of guys driving around in, uh, in Land Rovers catching up with various, uh, various predators uh, in the bush, but in reality, the, the BBC had built an entire studio complex out of the, out of the African bush um, to, uh, to do this. So, I mean, the, I mean, the resources that they brought, brought, brought to this program was absolutely enormous. Uh, probably the one program which um, uh, defined, I think, Discovery an Apple Planet in the very early part of uh, the last decade. And uh, that, of course, was the late, great Steve Irwin. And, um, you know, love him or hate him, he, he really was the, uh, the catalyst for that whole genre of, men, you know, butch men in khaki wrangling dangerous animals. And, um, you know, the, uh, you know, and, and I, a lot of people, I still think, um, you know, regard this as, as demeaning and not proper wildlife shows, but the truth is, you know, it did attract huge audiences and uh, there was some real behaviour and it got people who perhaps wouldn't normally be interested in wildlife programming engaged with the, with the characters and the, and the immersive style of, um, of interaction that, that they have with their various animals and, um, you know, I mean, as far as I can tell, I mean, it's run out of steam, you know, there are now some, um, uh, some characters like Ray Mears or whatever that, that, that have, um, you know, very credible spots within 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 schedules, but the the days the days of the uh, uh, the, man, the man in khaki is really gone. Um, um, so let's uh, you know let's have a look at a bit, a bit of uh, bit of crocodile hunter and uh, see see what what animal planet was really saying it was in two thousand. 
And the, fun, and the final question, Madam Planet, Planet, uh, is me, Cat Man, apart from shame and self publicity. Um, it's a, it was an interesting moment. It actually was about 2003. But um, as Alison um, alluded to with Walking the Dinosaurs, um, which crossed that line of anthropomorphism that um, speculated on uh, animal characters and uh, their emotions and their relationships with each other. Um, Meerkat Manor probably was the first animal soap opera and um, it was very carefully regulated by our masters at Cambridge University who were our, who were our partners on the programme that we didn't cross the line but we gave the animals, um, all the animals had names, in fact they, um, they uh, names from the researchers um, and, um, and quite a bit of art, you know, artistic license was given to, to actually the commentary to actually speculate what the relationship between all the animals were. Um, and the, I mean, it was interesting, the, the first uh, series producer that we brought in um, had in fact worked on a couple of series of EastEnders. So, I mean, well, you know, the, you know the, one, the, one, the, one, the one thing that natural history producers uh, are great at is taking great images, but, um, you know, they, they didn't really have much track record in drama. And uh, so it was getting all those, um, all those elements uh, right. Um, and um, I, I produced the first series that, that left, and the, the, only, the only footnote was that um, uh, OSF uh, uh, very kindly allowed me the honour of being the only person on the planet that had a meerkat named after him. Big sigh, which is, uh, which is great. And we had Whippy Goldberg and um, Opera Winfrey who had written to us to ask to have names of uh, Meerkats named after them, and they both refused. That's all. The, the, the only trouble is having left. They her. asked. They asked. They wrote, <laughs> and uh, but the thing is that it wasn't our call. But a uh, big, big side is it. Can I just make <laughs> a comment before before you cut? Because I do think that while you might think, God, we're looking at all this old stuff. Yeah. I mean, what's actually happened in those last two clips is, as you've just told us, you've just showed us two absolutely fundamentally programs that actually, you know, we're still doing kind of clone, well not clones exactly, yeah. but, you know, we're doing the children of those programs. So, I mean, Steve Irwin is like, I mean, what is that big thing on Discovery at the moment? Swamp, Swamp Brothers or yeah, something. Yeah. Swamp which is, it, which is, you know, it's Steve Irwin history. all over again. They've got a zoo in, I don't know, somewhere, Florida, I think it is. Same kind of stuff, but, you know, bigger and glossier and all that. And your meerkat manner, I mean, Alan Erson's here from, from Australia. Alan commissioned a programme called Penguin Island, yeah. and it was a co-production with the BBC, and it was a penguin soap opera. The penguins all had little names, didn't they? And we kind of identified with them and all that. And so this is a genre that, you know, will run and run. And it went on the four series, and uh, interestingly, yet to be... Um yet to be released, but um, OSF were producing with Sky and National Geographic, actually, um, uh, the first 3D film with uh, uh, um, called The Make Us. Um, uh, you know, and, I mean, it's an interesting thing is that uh, there are not too many animals, actually, you can make so properties about. Um, uh, this is a highly habituated group of animals. Um, and, you know, a lot of stuff has been tried, particularly with captive chimps, and, um, but, you know, you can't really do it on gorillas because they just sit there and scratch their bottoms all day and do very little. Uh, and elephants don't move very quickly, and uh, so, you know, I mean, to be honest... Isn't that like the real world? That's <laughs> like the real world, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, most of the people never work for me, I let's, suspect. Let's, let's, you want to see that? Let's, yeah, let's see yeah. the anyway, so here's anthropomorphism gets, uh, gets credibility, I think. Probably... Summing up then, I mean, what strikes me is you've got BBC, uh, those programs really hold up, right? It's yeah, yeah. Big budgets, uh, big topics, they're gorgeous, big audiences, their audiences know what to expect and they deliver all the time. Yeah. And then you've got the smaller, uh, you've got Steve Irwin who's shocked shock jock kind of guy. Yeah. And then you've got the really clever, creative meerkat. So that's a then. Yeah. We've got the BBC with big, big and high quality and you know, they just deliver time after time. Mm. And so what about now? Right, well we've got, I've got two, um, two tapes for you. One is um, uh, the BBC, BBC NSU 2011 showreel. We're gonna have to do a bit of uh, fast forwarding again. Which has got uh, life, lost land of the tiger, inside the perfect predator, which is um, uh, really uh, an extraordinary um, step forward in terms of CGI and human planet, which I'm sure you will be familiar with. And then we'll go straight on to the Animal Planet 2011 network reel, which is um, must love cats, Bondi vet, pit bulls, and parolees, animal ER, and dog rescuing. Uh, uh, oh my. New, New York City, and I mean, I mean, the interesting thing was they didn't volunteer any, you know, natural history programs at all. There's actually not a wild animal inside um, uh, on those, and uh, you know, and 
I guess for the last 10 years, you know, this is really a polarization of the brand. Um, you know, they, they think they know where their audience is, and, and it probably doesn't really involve straight natural history programming, again, which I think is slightly depressing, but, um, uh, you know, and life moves on. I'm sure, I'm sure, it, I'm sure it will change. But anyway, let's, let's have, a, have a quick look at um, BBC, and I think, you know, what we'll see is here that, that you know, the imagery has um, moved on even, even further from things like Blue Planet and uh, Andy's Travis. Um, so, life. So I want to um, get uh, just a quick here. comment. Just yeah. a quick comment because uh, I think you know you won't be surprised to hear that I was talking to a discovery executive, Soto Voce, just last week, and she actually said to me, "Quote: There is absolutely no science on U.S. cable TV, even on the Science Channel. Science and Discovery generally don't do science anymore. <laughs> they take scientists and put them in situations or dock soaps." <laughs> I don't think that's true. <laughs> I'm just, you know, anyway, that, I'll come back on, it's time. That. That's an actually a very interesting segue, by the way, because history doesn't do history any longer. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's all jump on the Americans. No, once no, again. No, no, no. Actually, you know, well, let's jump on the Americans for a moment, and the Brits. There's, there's, a, there's a distinctive prejudice that we've been showing on this table, I mean, in addition to Simon's great pimpage of uh, BBC <laughs> and Animal Planet. The, the fact is, is that what we've been discussing is a really Anglo-Saxon oriented um, uh, slate of programs and, and slate of ideas. And it was precisely 12 years ago, 13 years ago, when I launched the History Congress, which later has changed as well, it was to try to overcome that uh, dilemma. And that was that we always tended to default back to our natural partners, that is the Americans and the Brits, or the Americans and the Canadians, or the Americans and the Aussies, or the Brits and so forth. And we wanted to try to sort of branch this out. So unfortunately, um, a lot of what we're describing is still coming out of that predilection to, uh, to, to this kind of Anglo-American thing. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I've seen over the last number of years, one of the great trends has been the arrival of other uh, histories or other points of view, uh, particularly the rise of German broadcasters, uh, I mean, Germans coming into the marketplace, the French coming into the, to the, to the co-productions. Um, and and the, the, the current sort of trend, I mean, which is a really exciting one, is the Asians arriving. And the, by, by that I mean is that suddenly they're kind of discovering themselves uh, and being able to sort of express their point of view out to, to the world, which is kind of a, a, a very new sort of, uh, um, a, I, I think, dynamic. Tom, let me just yeah. interrupt you because I realized I didn't uh, introduce you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so for, uh, uh, to introduce Tom, Tom Koch uh, is head of uh, PBS uh, uh, International Distribution and has for many years uh, been uh, the premier distributor of uh, history programming and various <coughs> other genres. But we have uh, Tom here today to talk about um, history uh, as a genre yeah. and how that has changed from now. Thanks, uh, I'm trying to, I need to jump that. Jump the gun there. Well, I'm glad you're excited. Well, <laughs> by the way, <coughs> since there's so few of you, um, you all get a party gift. <laughs> um, you can take samples of history programming that I bought, and please take it away. I don't want to take it back to the U.S. You know, I, I, I do want to just start for you because um, there is, I think we do all, science, the science program, I think that was really interesting to see the BBC that are now, because to me it's not that much different on the BBC. Mm -hmm. It's, you're right, somehow the images are better, which when you're watching the, the then, you can't imagine how they could be better, and then they, and then they are. Um, so just, you know, spectacular. Um, on the other side, on the, the cable side, there's an evolution of style and, you know, some might say a kind of little lower brow uh, approach. Um, on the history side, I think there really has been a raging debate about how history programming, uh, you know, I know working at A&E, there was constant debate and discussion about what is history, how do we cover history, what do we mean by history programming, um, and I, I think one thing I do definitely, because Tom has a really unique vantage point, is talk about the rise of co-production and how that has um, helped push uh, American programming, because you've got international partners who are, are, you know, asking for other programs, but also to really talk about the event now. Well, I mean, history is kind of a unique thing because uh, uh, Dawn's correct. I mean, where does history start? Where does it stop? I mean, where where does a current affair and a current event become a historical fact or artifact 
and when do you start doing these things? Well, I mean, looking over the sweep of, of television history, you know, uh, the, the, the historical documentary kind of begins post-war, of course, World, Second World War, with, obviously, war programs, you know, World at War, Victory at Sea, uh, that kind of thing. Very voice of, uh, you know, uh, uh, voice of God saying this is what happened, grand strategy, grand uh, uh, approach. Um, and then it sort of morphs. I mean, history doesn't really exist on television until really it gets into the 70s as a genre. But then suddenly what it really becomes are these grand epic, uh, um, uh, in, uh, 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 I'm sorry, um, hosted programs like Kenneth Clark's Civilization or Alistair Cook's America or uh, Bronowski's um, um, Ascent. Ascent. Ascent of Man. I mean, these are, or, 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 or Carl Sagan's Cosmos. I mean, these are big, 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 important, hugely expensive at the time, um, uh, hosted, this is my point of view. But what's interesting about this, if you look at all of these characters, with the exception of Sagan, who is, who is very much American, is that there, these were American Brits in an odd way. I mean, Kenneth Clark and, and uh, uh, Alistair Cook, I mean, Alistair Cook lived in the United States from the 30s, I think wrote a letter from America, but he was really an American, but it went back and forth. In other words, he could tell the British point of view of American history, and that actually is weird because that's going on today. 40 years later, we've gone right back to that with Neal Ferguson's Ascent of Money, or Simon Schama, you know, these Brit-Americans who are doing the same kind of dual hosting. You know, they're Brits and they're Americans, and they're kind of going back and forth that way. Well, we think if it's a British presenter, it must be true. Um, <laughs> kind of, but I, I'm not sure that, that, that Ferguson and Shama carry the same weight that Alistair Cook might have, as weird as that sounds. I mean, these are real professionals, and I mean, they're top professors in their class, but I'm not sure they, they, they fit that, that place. At any rate, what I guess I'm getting at at this point is, in terms of the genre, there are really two genres that have come and gone and come and gone. The first one is the serious, straightforward voice of God archive drama or archive history or the presenter-led and currently we're back in the presenter-led world in my opinion in terms of history and science is that and, and that creates a dilemma because that means you're really creating a program for a very specific audience or alternatively and a subset of that kind of presenter-led thing is that history has become and this is when the history kind part of the Part of the reason I wanted to start history years ago was to overcome localism. In other words, how do you create a story that can travel globally that isn't strictly my little story that appeals to my specific audience? And Barbara, with all due respect, Barbara Beeman from uh, NDR, um, this is one of the things that I constantly hear and we grapple with between the United States and Germany, for example. Barbara has to appeal to a very specific German audience when she commissions. So if there's not a German element in a film, the tendency is maybe I don't touch it. But that goes the other way around as well. If there's not a very specific American element in a history program, it's very tough to do, you know, to get on the US. So there are great programs in Germany that are being made that don't get a fair shake in the United States and vice versa because we're appealing to a very specific audience. And that's actually true all around the globe. You know, in, and, and by the way, what I'm really speaking of here are, dare I say, serious history programs. I don't mean to, to belittle our colleagues on the cable side, but these are programs that really are trying to tell a history um, uh, that might be traditional in, in, in a sense. Um, two things that happened also in, in the marketplace, and, and a lot of what's happened at History Channel and Discovery and other places is really driven by finances and business plans. The, 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 the really, really dirty problem uh, in the last 15 years in history program, particularly archive history program, is the extraordinary uh, uh, um, uh, increase in the cost of archive. And the fact that an archive-based uh, program, um, you're going to spend as much as a quarter of your budget simply on archive that you don't own and can't control and can't reuse and repurpose. And what happens is that means that a lot of broadcasters have gone away from archive-based programs or at least those archives that they can't actually own and control. So if you're a Discovery Channel, and I think this is a wise and, and sound business choice, 
Um, basically, they say, if we, we want to build it, we want to own it, we want to be able to repurpose it, we want to use it in any platform we want, and we want to be able to turn it upside down, inside out, whatever we want to do. But if you have 70 clips from Corbis or 70 clips from the British uh, War Museum or Imperial War, War Museum, you can't do that. So what have they done? They've created entire new genres which are absent of archive. In fact, it's all shot live, um, you know, sort of that sort of thing. And that's exactly what's happened in history as well. Um, and that's why history has kind of shifted gears in addition to wanting to get away from the male-dominated history audience, which history is basically male-dominated um, because it's primarily been war, 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 Hitler, Hitler, Hitler. Um, they wanted to change their demographic and they've kind of reinvented themselves. And that's where Ice uh, Road Truckers, Deadliest Catch, and those kind of things uh, come out and, and are, are branded kind of as history or something else. One, it's, it's repurposable. Two, it's uh, fungible, if that's the right word. Uh, you know, it can be used across many platforms and turned into many different things. Three, there's no additional cost. We own it outright. Um, and that has driven very much sort of the, the thinking. And it, and it travels well. And it travels pretty well, yeah. yeah. So the, the problem with, with, with history is it's either very local and speaks to a very specific audience, or it's not history at all in a weird way. It becomes something else, it becomes entertainment or whatever the case is. Now, I, I'm, I'm gonna stop here because I, we, I, I'd rather just open this up to lots of conversations. I do wanna show one clip though. Um, this was a, a piece that was presented uh, two years ago here at Church Sheffield, which I, I, we were pitching this thing. Um, we took 20 pitches. Um, we didn't get a single pre-sale. We didn't get a single pre-buy. Um, we got nothing. The film went on to win two Emmys, Writers Guild Award, a Peabody, and was uh, shortlisted for the Oscar. And I just want to show this one. So if you have a great idea, and you don't get a pitch here, you can still get it made, and it might do pretty well. And it came from Sheffield. Sheffield. Yeah, it's Sheffield. This is a, a My Lai, a, a My Lai massacre. So, um, that's spectacular. But I want to ask you all, uh, since probably a, a good part of our audience is uh, producers. So, you know, what are we saying here for producers? I take it if you're Jane or John, you're not going to march into the BBC with aerial footage shot in high def, you know, super slow mo, and get a commission. So, uh, you know, what are we saying here really for producers? What's the. Well, the first thing here? that Tom's actually put his finger on is that the biggest trend of all time, which is terrible for people that want to make science and presumably history documentaries as well, but the science documentaries. One-off science documentaries, I don't know any commission editor who's regularly commissioning one-off science documentaries at the moment. Are you Alan? Uh, Alan from Australia, ABC. No, but, but not, you know, it's not the trend, is it? So the trend is definitely not one-off, and that's really difficult. Well, Nova does. I mean, uh, you know, Nova Horizons. But how many? Like six a year or something? Uh, probably. You yeah. know, I mean, really, like, so for, for, for new documentary makers coming into the business to want to make a one-off documentary, it's really hard. I mean, what, what I did in the presentation was confuse it by going around the world and saying who the, who the potential other partners are. I mean, there are, there are places, and Ruth and I have had a recent experience, for instance, so with a, a new Austrian um, a production company called Terra Mata, which uh, came out of university, and uh, they'll, they'll put real money into very traditional um, blue chip, uh, one-off uh, one natural history films, but the reality is uh, okay, you, is that a broadcaster or a, no, a, they're a new broadcaster? A new broadcaster. They're attached. Uh, they're funded by Red Bull, um, mm -hmm. the drink, um, and uh, they're the big, Austria's biggest company, and they're associated with the, with the TV channel. And, uh, and uh, they're they're a new player in town, and yeah. there are one or two other European um, partners you can go to, and, um, and Canada, and uh, there is WNET Nature, and, um, which I think is in decline, actually, in some ways. Yeah, I, mean, I was particularly talking about Anglo market, go on, Alan. The ABC would do, does lots of one-off natural yeah. history. Yeah. One-off natural yeah. history. But science is a bit tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me, Thanks. I want to say one thing, though, that's really, really important for you, for young producers particularly, is that I, I, I come from a very, specific public broadcast uh, uh, environment. I've been, I've, I've been weaned in this world for a long time. The one thing that we always look at, we look, there's, there are any number of technical tricks, you know, whether it's CGI, animation, uh, high def, uh, fast cutting, whatever you want to do, and I have every reason to believe that all of you are exceptionally competent. And, and or, or your editors are extraordinarily competent in creating great visuals. If not you, you know somebody. 
Pardon? If not, if not you, you know somebody well, you know, down there. Well, you know, we can do the, I mean, the visuals. I don't give a shit about the visuals. In a way. I care about one thing. Are you going to tell me a hell of a good story? Yeah, that's absolutely it, yeah, yeah. And if you can't sit down and tell me a great story and keep me just captivated without showing me pictures, I don't think, for my, for my money, and I don't mean to be uh, you know, tough about this, I don't think you can make a great film. If you can't write a New Yorker article, let's put it that way, and that's why I always tell people to strive to, write the New Yorker article, and then that will become a great television show, particularly in history or current affairs. Um, and if you don't read the New Yorker, I, I, I'm not, you know, he, he, we got the BBC through, I'll pimp for the New Yorker. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the greatest magazines on the planet. For, for storytelling and how you tell stories. And, and I really believe that's incredibly important. You know? so we, um, we're coming to where we should have like, some good time for questions, but I do want to leave people with some concrete kind of trends. So if you each had, I'll just go down the line. Um, so mm -hmm. Allison, what would you say is today, uh, so two questions, one, What's, what's the trend? What are you seeing? What are commissioners looking for? And two, if you're a producer, what's your best shot um, if you've got some track record but you really want to you know, kind of continue to make your career in science programming? Well, um, in this Anglo-Saxon dominated world, um, it's definitely format and series that fit into, you know, it, it, rather than the one-off documentary. And, and, and it's looking for light heart, I'm talking science of course here, okay, so it's looking for, for light hearted uh, ways of telling science, but you know, occasionally you get to see a hell of a lot of science out of something, for example on Channel 4, Inside Nature's Giants, which I don't know is going into its third series I think. And, and that, that was just a fantastic idea. They had to do autopsies on dead animals. You know? So if, if a whale, if they don't kill them, but you know, if a whale dies out in the wild or whatever, they, you know, then they're they happen to die in a production cycle. And they, <laughs> they, they, they go for it. And, uh, and, and the science that you find out about the, you know, the habits of those animals is absolutely m massive and it's great. So it's, the, it's formats, it's series. Um, and, um, and, and in the States, well, I mean, I would really encourage people to look to the States because there is so much more going on. And, um, and there are the occasional opportunities for one-off docs. I mean, there's a huge series coming out on Discovery at the moment that's changed its changed tack. It's called Curiosity. And because it's changed tack, it's actually looking to doing um, one-offs. And they still, they've still got 15 hours of those curiosities to commission. And they are just looking for good ideas, and the sort of things that they're looking at are answering big questions. So, you know, is there a god? Uh, what if aliens attack? Uh, what's the purpose of the female orgasm? They've all they've all been commissioned, but you know, it's wide open. Um, and in fact, someone else in in the states was 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 telling me that, um, and this was at the History Channel, that actually they do do quite a lot of one-offs there, and that is a way in. For new producers, if you get the story right, like Tom said, if you've got something really good, um, and then of course the other way of doing it is to team up with with a with a bigger, more established producer, and that's a way of, of getting yourself into into the established producer sort of uh, genre. Bring your good idea, marry up, get a good credit. Yeah. Okay. And and I think the biggest trend in in the UK, but I'm sure you guys would know better than me. But it seems to me that we we live events, live event stuff. But that's quite hard to do as a, as, a, as a young producer. But, you know, Spring Watch, isn't that the biggest kind of uh, most amazing thing? People sit and watch live birds nesting and yeah. all that sort of stuff. And it's huge. And then the anymore. BBC did Stargazing Live and Weather. Uh, I think they're doing something called Weather Live. Maybe hasn't gone out yet. But, you know, I mean, that would be that would be something. If you could come up with an idea like that and find somebody, you know, to make it with that was a good producer, I reckon you'd be onto something. Yeah, I, listen. I, I mean, I think Tom Tom summed it up. I think there, there are two two parallel trends in, uh, in natural history programming. I, I mean, I think technology comes to the rescue in terms of reinventing itself. Things like three D are going to be probably the next big big thing. I think the internet is going to be, be playing a big part, um, particularly in wildlife programming with viewer audience originated footage streaming down the web. I think there'll be new formats originating from that. But ultimately, um, it's uh, it's about coming up with the, the next new idea on wildlife programming, natural history programming. Um, the subject is not good enough. It's the story, as Tom says. Uh, it's and the presenter. It's unique access, it's the presenter, uh, and increasingly un uh, unscripted formats, I think, are becoming uh, 
you know, uh, are, are the way forward. But it's, um, uh, it is, you know, in many ways, I think it is uh, at, the, at the commercial end, it is, it is a genre in decline because it is scrambling around trying to reinvent itself. And with digital switch off uh, in the UK heralded for, for, you know, for next year, uh, and the gatekeepers um, hold on the business will be eroded. I, you know, I think uh, uh, I think players like Animal Planet and National Geographic are, are going to find themselves um, uh, having to reinvent themselves very, very quickly because I think uh, you know I think it's all going to change. So there'll be opportunity. I mean, you know, I think technology will create create change. But if you're a producer, to say I've got um, you know an animal that's never been filmed before and they'll let me into the place and I'm the only one isn't enough, it's got to be, uh, you've got to have a narrative device which is going to be, feel new and fresh, um, and you've got a presenter, uh, it's going to have to be, you know, they're, they're very conservative uh, broadcasters, particularly Animal Planet, National Geographic, and five, uh, you know, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, so, how, you know, you, you'll, you're going to have to find something fairly special to, uh, to, to make that movie. Get their attention. Yeah. And Tom. I mean, in history, I sort of see two things happening. One is, is emblematic by this show, uh, which is called The Chronicle of the Third Reich, which is a Spiegel TV thing that came out a year and a half ago, I think. Um, what's interesting is that, uh, is that uh, 10 years ago, we all wanted, and we were all in the, in the thrall of, of um, uh, recreated documentaries, dramatized documentaries, that sort of thing, and I remember going to the Germans once and saying, you know, why don't you get into this project? We were doing something on Darwin, I think it was. And they said, drama will never, ever, ever do that. We won't possibly touch it. Well, now, if you don't have drama in Germany, you can't get a commission. I mean, it's kind of weird. They've gone the other way. And in the US and the UK, we've kind of drifted away from dramatized history. But what happened was Spiegel just put this thing together, four hours with three talking heads, History of the Third Reich, and it's 100% document, 100% archive, this thing raided through the roof. In other words, people just went back to an old-fashioned, straightforward format, and this got 12 or 13 percent share in the audience. I mean, on Spiegel TV, just huge, huge numbers. So there's that side of thing. Just the straightforward archive film that's seriously done, well-crafted, and there are millions of topics. You don't have to do war again, but millions of topics. Think about you know, all the great stuff that's done, whether you did a thing on Henry Kissinger or a thing on Robert McNamara. There's endless, endless characters. No one's ever, ever done a film on Jacques Chirac, you know, and, and, and his potentially corrupt regime in France. I mean, there are endless sort of things that are going that you can do. On the other hand, um, there is this ten trend, as I said, to highly uh, uh, presenter-led, uh, so find the smartest, cleverest presenter in your world. And whether he's a professor or she's a, a, a doctor or whatever the case is, find him. And that's the other Speaking of that, I've never seen a history program led by a female, presented by a woman. I think that could be very interesting. Oh, Bethany Hughes. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm not very few. In the oh, U.S. Oh, almost. Oh, in the U.S. You never, it's always some vaunted Harvard, Princeton, Oxford, Cambridge uh, professor. So that could be a way. I think a way in is, I think, frankly, be a girl. That's the way in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a, a female presented show in the United States on uh, doing serious history, I think, would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have questions? I think it's a question. Yep. Because we have to stay on time. Mm -hmm. Question? Comments? Comments. Comments? Oh, come on, you guys. What about yeah. Tony, Tony from, from Asia? Because that <laughs> documentary is actually really doing well, isn't it? History and science document. Tony's just here yeah. in the front. I mean, Asia documentary is sort of suddenly flowering. Is that on? Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the Asia documentaries, I think there's more interest in lifestyle now because I think it's more aspirational now because Asia is growing in China and India. So people aspire to kind of like, you know, to the lifestyle they want. So essentially, we're seeing more trend in lifestyle luxury type of programming. Whereas in the more serious documentary history is going on, like what Tom said, I, I totally agree. I remember we did something, uh, just built something for a uh, history channel, entirely made of archive. And, and uh, it was the last emperor of China, Pu Yi. There was absolutely no re recreation, uh, no uh, sort of like reenactment, but entirely on archive. It was one of the highest rated shows on, on history channel. 
So I think people are going back to that style of wanting to look at some old archive, old fashioned style. And also National Geographic actually reformatted the Forbidden City inside the Forbidden City entirely with footage that they call from a CCTV, which uh, have primarily 100 years of um, archive they have put in. And they actually put that together, of course, with some retreatment at coming up to HD. But again, one of the example of how people are actually taking on and consuming content of that nature much more than having to do something fancy with CGI's and all that. Which, was was yeah. that locally produced or was it co-produced with other... It was European? all locally produced, not even European. It was done with Asian productions and we are involved in that and, and we re-scripted it and so it was actually very well received. So I think history is coming back in fashion. I think there is a great demand for science programming uh, still to me. Uh, but you need to make it easier for people. You don't want it too academic, basically. So I think, and the other third thing I, I find a lot more as a producer and distributor is the fact that reversioning is also coming a bit more because we do a lot of, of reversion with NHK, where NHK was made for Japanese audience with their prime time slot, but they are, they are eager to get it out to the more international market like Europe and, and, and Canada, US and North America. But they find it a bit restrictive because the way it was scripted was very much um, not for the European audience. So we reversion it completely uh, with newer music, re-scripting, we take away a lot of the Japanese talking hate and we make it a bit more entertaining. But unfortunately, that's the way to do it, to get the audience more um, in tune with the kind of subject matters in wildlife, particularly. But so you know, we see some of that, but I think definitely a lot of opportunity in Asia. So. Yes. What, what is the digital switch off? Um, it's uh, the uh, analog signal, which is how we receive our over the air television signal, um, will be fully digitalized by the end of 2012. Austria did it two weeks ago. It's what we did two years ago. So, what, what is the significance of well, the Well, it basically means that, um, uh, that the potential for if you like, crossover between what your television does and what your computer does. And the traditional gatekeepers of multi-channel television have been Rupert Murdoch and, and the satellite and Sky, no longer in potentially have their, their stranglehold on, on the channel market. It just means that, that streaming video and um, YouTube television, I mean, you know, a, the younger audience, I'm sure, will embrace the new technologies. But the, uh, if you like, the... Uh, uh, the monopolies of, uh, of uh, satellite and cable, which has delivered us all the other channels outside the uh, terrestrial public service broadcasts in the UK, will be uh, undermined, and I think it will create a whole new market. So it will open it up, and uh, I think break, break the monopolies down over time. Telephone companies uh, will be providing television services. Well, one minute. Andre. just have one short observation and then one question. Um, the, the observation is that uh, a lot of what has been said, uh, and I think we all are very much aware is, um, I can't remember who was saying, is very much the Anglo-Saxon world of history, science, natural history. <coughs> and um, I doubt that we're ever going to get away from the current obsession with presented programs, which certainly on British television sort of are, are, are very good. I mean, you just can't get away from them. And, um, in, on, on one level, that's fine. And you know, I, we, we've done a big series with a celeb presenter and so on, and it's very successful. And we could almost do any program we wanted with that presenter, the narrative being almost irrelevant. I mean, it's, comes secondary, the presenter comes first and the subject matter almost becomes secondary. And it's, it's a little tiresome, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I think, something that's going to continue and however much one likes or doesn't like it, I think we're stuck with it. Um, and what, what seems at the moment, and what I, I, I'm just wondering if the panel has any comment on, is what we're avoiding a little bit is the new world of television that's coming from Asia, from India, from Brazil, from all the, all, all the, the big economies that are now sort of coming up there and have their own mass audiences and mass demands and so on. The Western television genres that we're talking about 
don't translate well in, the, in those economies. They they take them, but they're not they're not really big business there. They're not they're not wanted to that extent. I'm, I'm just wondering what efforts are being made to try and combine forces more, not just us making programs there for our audiences, but trying to properly do co-productions with the Asian or, or South American world and seeing how that can work. We have a panel yeah. called Working with Asian Co-Productions. <laughs> we have a panel called Working for uh, Asian Co-Productions and that will be on... It's five o'clock this afternoon. Well done. <laughs> okay, yeah, and that's where you will find the answer to that and we have to wrap. <laughs> let, let, me, no, let, me, let me answer that question just a second. Let me, yeah, let me address that. Let, oh, let, yeah. me, let, let me try to address that in, in a way. There, there, the first, the, the reason for the Anglo-American conspiracy, first of all and foremost, is language. It's very simple for me to pick up the phone and talk to you, with, and you have no trouble hearing and listening to me, and like what I say, but that's all I'm um, The Europeans basically have become Anglophones insofar as us doing business in TV. The number of people in NHK who don't speak English is rather shockingly high. Now, sh I mean, shockingly for me, not for them. So you first have a big language barrier to overcome. And secondly, with respect to history and certain genres, I don't necessarily agree that the stuff that's made here doesn't translate there. I believe it does, because I remember going to NHK about 12 years ago. We thought we would have this great idea where Admiral Perry comes with the black ships and, and comes to uh, Tokyo Harbor and sort of uh, you know, opens up Japan. We thought it was a great idea. They've done over 110 films on the same topic. They looked at me and said, You've got to be kidding me. We have an archive of films we've been making for the last 20 years on the same topic. Why don't you just take our film and go the other way around? Well, the problem is we didn't know that because we don't speak Japanese. And we've never seen this stuff. And my suspicion is in all of these, I mean, uh, what Tony had just said, that doing the great, uh, I mean, uh, the Forbidden City and finding 100 years of footage from, uh, you know, that we're in the archives of CCTV, I bet there is a massive rich vein of stuff to be uh, uh, found, if we can get our hands on it. I, I, I just make one other very quick observation on your point, Andre, is that, you know, as the production dollar, dollar gets stretched more and more, the, um, you know, the, the pressure to co-produce um, obviously gets more and more. And the trouble about presenter-led programming is that broadcasters want a name that is suitable for their brand. And first in their forms, market. Yeah, yeah, and their market. And the fact is that that presenter probably doesn't travel. But there is still the pressure on the producer to go and find, find uh, co-production dollars elsewhere. So I mean, I, you know, I, mean, I think it is increasingly becoming a, a big issue about presenter programming, just, just in terms of how one funds programming. So All presenters should speak Esperanto, I guess, or something, right? <laughs> so the big takeaway, <laughs> surprise, surprise, you all need to go to more conferences and meet up producers and all work together. So um, I want to thank everybody for uh, collecting all that information and uh, uh, giving us the view from then and now, um, and have a good market. Good